All right, good morning. Welcome once again to Simple Faith. If you open your Bibles with me, please, this morning to Romans chapter 9. We go verse by verse through a book of the Bible on Sunday mornings, chapter by chapter, Wednesday nights, and we're in the, currently in the Gospel of John on Wednesday nights. What a wonderful time that has been. Romans chapter 9, as we look at verses 19 through 23 this morning. Let's go ahead and read that, and then we'll pray. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 19. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to the, him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might take, make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we come once again to study your word, Lord, and even these deep things that, that, we're, that we're going over this morning, would you soften our hearts to hear from you this morning? Would you give us ears of understanding, spiritual understanding, Lord? Would you anoint us each now with your spirit? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to get the context, if you look back with me at verse 14... And then we'll kind of read into our text this morning. Verse 14, Paul is saying, he says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills nor him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Verse 19, you will say then to me, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? So as Paul is talking about the sovereignty of God, that he has created vessels uh, for honor, for he has created vessels for dishonor, as he's talking about predestination. And we've been talking about this the last several weeks. It is a biblical fact that God predestines, that God chooses. And we've talked about this. It's also a biblical fact, I need to say, that God gives us complete free will. And we can't go to either side and say, oh, God doesn't do this, God doesn't do that. He does it. How does he, how does he have complete sovereignty and choose? And how does he give us complete free will? His ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. He just lets us know about it. He just says, this is how it is. But again, there are those of us who will look at this and say, well, if you choose people, then why does God still find fault? Why does he still find fault? Paul asks here in verse 19, for who has resisted his will? Now, what's interesting to me is Paul is kind of going into an interesting area. He's going into an area where we as human beings, we like to question God. I find it honestly an interesting thing that we as mere human beings think that we can question God Almighty. Verse 19 again, why does God find fault at all? Uh, the New Living Translation says it this way, well then you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? And that's what the simpleton would say. That's what the simple mind would stay, say. Instead of understanding that it, while God chooses, he's also given everyone free will. Remember back in Romans chapter 8. He said those whom he foreknew, those he predestined. Those whom he foreknew what? 
I believe that he's saying there, those whom he foreknew would respond in a positive manner to the grace of God. And so he predestined them. And but again, coming back to this, who are you, you know, that you'd question God there? You ask these questions. You know, I believe it is within our human nature that we are very prideful. That we are very prideful as human beings. And, and I don't know, for some reason we think that we can question God. Maybe it's because we we're created in the image of God and we, you know, we seem to have little problem then questioning God. Because, I don't know, what, are we so smart? Are we so holy? You know, are, are we so righteous and powerful that we think we can question God? And I think if we're all honest, we've all done it at one point or another. We, we've all asked, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? We look around us today, why are you allowing the unrighteous to prosper? And yet we don't understand, you know, why do we think we're so special that God should listen to us? You know, the absurdity of this thought is truly beyond reason in a way. Yet today, so many seek to question God, even so many within the church, to judge God, even to judge his word. Well, Jesus wouldn't say that. The Bible wouldn't say, oh, we don't accept the writings of Paul there. You know, we, we, and we set ourselves up as judge, jury, and executioner over God. It's kind of crazy. With our vast knowledge of the universe. I, I, I asked this question earlier uh, at, the, at the first service. How many people here have been to the other side of Mars? Any, anybody? <laughs> Nobody? All right, here's an easy. How many people have been to the other side of the moon? How many people here have been to every country on the earth? But we still think we can question God. He who was everywhere at one time. I mean, sincerity, when, you, when we think of the absurdity. Now, here's Paul's reply. Look at verse 20. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? I like how other versions say it. But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Another version, who are you, a mere human being, to talk back to God? And the paraphrase, I love this. Who in the world do you think you are to second-guess God? You know what? We think we're all that in a bag of chips. We do. For some reason, it's an odd thing. Who do we think we are that we would reply against God? To question someone on a particular subject implies that we have a knowledge of that subject. You know, Pastor Jay, an engineer, retired engineer, remember when they first started coming, he, he was retired, but they kept wanting him so badly. We needed to fly to Japan. We needed to do this. And, and, and I could sit and I could talk to Jay about these, you know, engineering feats that he's been a part of. And I'd be sitting there really like this. <laughs> Or you ever, you know, you see somebody who's an artist and, and they, they paint this great thing. And, and like I have this one friend, Junho Kim, and he's a pastor down in Arizona. And he's, he's, he draws with this pencil. He just, phenomenal. And, and he'll do like a lot of military things and, and, you know, have a guy sitting there. So one time I decided I'm going to copy him. And, and I did my little stick figure of a guy with a circle and two arms. That's my drawing. Now imagine me going to Juno and saying, hey, you know, I, I know how to tell you how to do this. That's how it is it is for us to go to God. How many people here have heard of Phil Wickham? Most of us here, we sing one of his songs today, very blessed, you know, by his worship. And, you know, by the way, we need to always pray for those guys and gals that God is using because he come, the enemy comes against. But Phil Wickham's been used of the Lord. But, you know, here I am. Imagine if, you know, because I play guitar and I've written some songs, I come up to Phil. Hey, Phil. <laughs> yeah, I play guitar too and I lead worship sometimes too. And I've written some praise songs too. You know, Phil, I need to let you know that a lot of your songs are written in the key of E. And I think that, you know, maybe you should use a little bit more of G sometimes or a little bit more of D sometimes. Or, you know, Phil, your strum patterns. You know, you always kind of go, imagine if you kind of just 
you know, change them up a little bit. He'd kind of look at me probably with grace and go, "Ah, thank you, thanks for that input. Here's somebody that God is using in mighty ways. How would I dare have the audacity to tell this fellow what to do? Now imagine, you know, (laughs) even going deeper. If Beethoven was sitting here in the front row, and I go, hey, Mr. Beethoven, I'm a big fan of yours. You know, did a report on you in junior high. Man, I just really like you. You know, I play guitar, Mr. Beethoven. I, I'm a musician, too. And uh, I don't really read music. I can read some music. I really like chord charts. And he'd probably be, what's a chord chart? I said, you know, but I got to talk to you about your, synth, your fifth symphony. You know, I think it would be a lot better if you added a little guitar in there. Maybe a little singing, you know, just to really get... Now, these are totally absurd thoughts. Me going to someone who knows infinitely more about these subjects, even though I do know a little, and trying to teach them. Again, magnify that on the times of God. How many times we go to God and tell him what we think? We question God. It's crazy. It would be like a kindergartner coming up to Albert Einstein and saying, So, I don't believe that your theory of relativity is correct because 2 plus 2 actually equals 18. What? It'd be silly. It'd be absurd. And yet, so too with God when we question Him. When we don't understand, well, I don't understand how God can choose and give us complete free will. I don't understand it. So what? I don't understand how Pastor Jay can, can, can build the things that God used him to build. I don't understand how Phil Wickham can do the things or Beethoven or others. That's okay. Well, we need to understand that God is God and we are not. God has revealed many things to us through nature so we can understand a bit about him. The Bible tells us that, Romans 1. God has revealed many things to us through our ability to think and to reason. God has given us specific details about who he is, who we are, why we're here, through his word, the Bible. He has told us these things. He's given us, you know, all the the men and women who have ever lived, the, the ability to reason and to knowledge and to reason these through, the knowledge that he has given to us. But here's the key. I know this is going to be hard for some of us to hear. It was hard for me to hear. You and I don't know everything. But we act like we do. He's not given us all knowledge. That is his alone. You know, it's interesting. You go online, you look up, you know, how much do we currently know? Right now, scientists, they'll say they roughly know 4% of what there is to know of the universe. 4%. So again, we may think we know a lot of things, and maybe you do know a lot of things. Maybe you have a super huge high IQ, your 193 IQ, and, and, and you can say all these things. Maybe you've read every book that's ever been written, so you're really smart. Have anybody here read every book that's ever been written? Never been to Mars? Haven't read all the books? What's going on here? How about 10% of all the books? Anybody here in 10% of all the books? Never? Huh. You know, when you start to think about, and again, this is what to me this text is doing. It tells us to stand back. When you start to think about all the things there is to know from science to arts to politics to music uh, to sports, etc., When you really go deeper and you start to think about all the things there are to know about God, And what he's revealed to us specifically through his word. There's no depth. It's it's so deep we can't find the depths. Not in one lifetime. Not in 900 years. Not in 1,000 years. Not in 10,000 years. So when we take a step back and look at the big picture, we start to feel pretty small. And to be honest, I think we need that a lot more today. I think a lot of things going on today when you go to buy uh, water in England, if you go to the east coast of England, you can't find bottles of water because uh, the the stores are having supply chain issues and so uh, there are things you can't get. Maybe last year you were caught in the, the great toilet paper shortage of 2020. 
We literally had people coming to our office, unbelievers. It was awesome. We'd give them a thing of toilet paper and some tracts in the Bible. There you go. Sincerely. But I don't know about you, but one of the things this last year has kind of done is hopefully taken us down a few notches is we're not as special as we thought we were. And you go even today to the, the stores and there's empty shelves. It doesn't matter if you go to Best Buy or Walmart or Safeway. There's empty shelves. Never, we've never had stuff like this. Look, guys and gals, what we understand is God knows everything and we do not. And this should make us feel pretty small. By the way, you know, welcome if you're visiting. I just want to come here and make you feel as terrible as you can. But pastor, I've gone to other churches and they make me feel great about myself. I'm so wonderful. No, you're not wonderful. You're not. I'm not. But there's great news to come later on. Stay tuned in because God isn't done talking yet. You see, the Bible says as we humble ourselves, he will lift us up. Trouble is, a lot of us don't like to humble ourselves. You ever meet anybody like that that, that knows everything about everything? It doesn't matter what, what you're talking to. And does it drive you nuts? It drives me nuts. I remember years ago at a teen study, uh, Tilly and I were teaching, and some little, it's like 15 years old. No, pastor, I think you're wrong on some of these theological issues. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> what do you say? I just laughed and said, well, Lord bless you, my little brother. Lord bless you. Look, God is eternal. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is merciful, holy. God is just. God is loving. God is good. God is pure. And there is no darkness in God at all. Can we have an amen to that? Amen. So again, as we compare ourselves to who and what God is, we are like a little speck of dust in the universe. Look at back in our text. And again, right now we should feel pretty, pretty insignificant. That's okay because the good stuff's still coming as well. This is all still good stuff. Verse 20 continues, Will the thing say to him, or excuse me, the thing formed say to him who was formed, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have the power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another to dishonor? You see, guys and gals, throughout the scriptures, God is referenced as the potter, and we the clay. And, and he molds us, even Christians, even now, as those who have been born again of the Spirit of God. As we deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him, as, as we allow God to, he's molding and conforming us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We're on a potter's wheel. You know, and sometimes it gets a little dizzying on that potter's wheel. Sometimes it can hurt as he's, you know, changing or maybe even taking some things out of our lives. But this is what Paul is pointing out. You know, how can the clay say to the potter, hey, why did you make me like this? And a lot of us as human beings, well, why didn't you give me a better voice, Lord? Why didn't you make me look better, Lord? Why didn't you do this? Maybe some of us feel, oh, we have it all down. I have a great voice. I look great. I'm wonderful. Just give it a few years. You see, as Paul is saying here in verse 21, basically the potter has the power over the clay. He can make one lump for honor. He can make another lump for dishonor. What's the clay to say anything about it? Now again, one cup of clay could be used as a cup for the king, a high honor. The other cup could be used as spittoon on the side of the street. It's the potter's choice what he wants to do. It's his choice. It's not our choice. Basically, God is God and we are not. God is God and we are not. Do we hear this this morning? And again, Job 14, 1 and 2. <laughs> Man who is born of woman is only a few days of trouble and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Our, we are here today, gone tomorrow. Do you understand that unless the Lord returns, unless the rapture of the church comes, 
you know, we're all not going to make it out of here alive in these bodies. And by the way, praise God, hallelujah, amen. But we are all going to die. And for the Christian, there is no true death. It's, we're, we believe in the resurrection. We are a resurrection people. But we need to understand this fact that the, the Bible says, look, man, we're a few days and man full of trouble. Amen to that these days. That Job 14 did. In Psalm 102, 11 and 12, my days are like a shadow that lengths. I wither away like grass. Anybody thankful for the rain last couple of days? I've been like, oh, man, I just want to go outside and do a little Gene Kelly, you know, singing in the rain. But I love it. And, you know, what's beautiful is you see the grass is starting to turn green again. By the way, get ready to mow. You're getting ready to mow again. But I also see in the weather forecast that I don't see any more rain in the future, you know. I, maybe it's coming again. I haven't seen anything, but... So that means in, you know, another week or so, it's going to start what? Turning brown again. Start dying again. You see, guys and gals, our days are like grass. We come up today, we're gone tomorrow. But it goes on in Psalm 102 to say, But you, O Lord, shall endure forever. God endures forever. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. You see, sometimes we need to be humbled and reminded of just who we are and who God is. When we feel so free to question God. Isaiah 40, starting in verse 6. Uh, so again, we're going to talk about ourselves a little bit first here. Isaiah starting in verse 6. Or starting chapter 40, verse 6. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like a flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. Look, guys and gals, you and I, our lives are here today, gone tomorrow. We're like a flower. I remember when we first moved up here many, many years ago. And, and in our backyard, we actually have a huge field back there. And the girls would go out and they'd pick all these flowers that were growing in the field, wild flowers. They were really just weeds, but they were beautiful. And they'd bring them in, and by the next day, they were dead. They were gone. And that's, that's your life. That's my life. We're not as important as we think we are. And, and that's okay. You look here in Isaiah 40, look up to verse 12. Who, and again, now he's talking about the Lord. This is talking about the Lord. Who has measured the waters in the hollows of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? In other words, who showed God all these things? Not you, not me. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. The nations, think of it, we're just part of a nation and are counted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Go up to verse 17. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Look at verse 21. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God? The words he gave before the world began. Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below him seem like grasshoppers to him. That's you and me. Hello, fellow grasshoppers. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent for them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them to nothing. Bill Gates, nothing. Donald Trump, nothing. It doesn't matter. The great people of the world, George Soros, nothing. Verse 24, they hardly get started, barely taking root. Then he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. 
To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Anybody here feel like they're equal with God? Verse 26, look up to the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Verse 28, have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. Now, for those of us that are still unconvinced, still thinking, I can question God. Uh, who, you know, I can say you know, that I don't agree with God when he does this, or I don't agree with God when he does that. And Job was having a talk with God. And this is what Job said, to, or God said to Job. Who is this dar- who darkens the counsel by words without knowledge? So imagine us. So this is us questioning God. This is God replying to you and me. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Anyone? You weren't on Mars. You, you haven't been to the moon. What's going on here? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its mentions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation? Who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars stand together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries and burst from the womb? And as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, for I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear? Anybody have commanded the morning? Get up and appear. Come up, son, from the east. That's, that's what he's saying. And cause the dawn to rise to the, in the east. Have you ever made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? As light approaches... The earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath a seal. It is robed in brilliant colors. And you know who did all that? Is God. He's God Almighty. He's God that is completely sovereign. And you are not. I am not. The bottom line is, James says it in James 4, 14, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, For what is your life? It is then a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Now, does this go against anybody's flesh here this morning? Because it goes against mine. I'm an American citizen after all. I'm a proud American citizen. I have rights after all. And by the way, we do. We should stand up for those. I'm not saying that. But my trust doesn't come in my rights. My trust comes in Jesus Christ. You see, and not even in myself. This goes against our pride. What we're talking about this morning, we need to admit that this goes against our pride. It goes against my pride too. Some of us more than others, perhaps. We want to feel more important than we actually are. We want to feel more in charge than we actually are. I get it. But guys and gals, here's a newsflash. If you didn't know, we're not in charge. And I, for one, I am so grateful for that. Anybody here pretty good at multitasking? Raise your hand if you're a pretty good multitasker. Nobody? There's a few of us. I'm a pretty good multitasker. But imagine if I had to stand up here and tell my heart to beat. All right, heart, I want you to beat, you know, this many times per minute. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, breath, I want you to breathe. (sighs) Eyes, I want you to blink every once in a while. The rest of the, you know, the system, I want you to do all this, do all that. You know, balance out. Imagine if you had to multitask like that. There's no way. But here's the thing. God is not only involved in every one of keeping your heart beating right now, which he is doing in every single one of us here, those who are watching, He's given you the breath of life even now, me too. But at the same time, guess what else he's doing? He's doing this for billions of people around the earth. He's working in the universe, making sure everything is in its place where it's supposed to be. He's named the stars. You see, to understand and accept what we are studying this morning, plainly said, takes humility. 
Oh, you mean I'm not as important as I thought I was? I'm not as in charge as I thought. I can't question God. You see, here's the beauty. And beauty, they say, is in the eye of the beholder. You may just be a wisp of smoke here today, gone tomorrow. We might just be a weed of a flower that's here today, gone tomorrow. But God still loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for you. What? For a wisp of smoke? For a weed of a, for a piece of dust? You mean love me that much? God loves us so much that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves us so much, you little wisp of smoke, your little weed, that, that he loves you so much that he, he sent his son to die for us even while we were yet sinners. You see, the importance doesn't come in who we are or what we do. What do you do for a living? Well, I do this. What do you, well, I do that. Why well, can't I do this? Who cares? You're a child of the king now. You're a child of God. Jesus came and died for you. That's where our importance comes. Not from, you know, feeling like, oh, well, I can ask God whatever I, you know, question things. Now, again, I'm not saying that we can't come to God with honest questions. We come to his word and seek out what his, what his answers are. That's, I'm not saying that. But our hearts of, who, who do we think we are? How could you do this, God? He can do it because he wants to. Look at verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels which, um, of wrath prepared for destruction? You, you see, what it's saying here is, I love this, God is actually showing much patience or long suffering, it says here, to the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Remember back in Romans chapter 8, those whom God foreknew, he predestined. Foreknew what? They fore, he foreknew how they were going to react, how you and I were going to react to the grace of God. If we're going to act in a, and react in a positive me measure, he, for, he predestined us to eternal life. If we're going to react in a negative manner, he predestined us to what we deserve, long suffering and punishment. Or, or suffering and punishment. And by the way, that's each one of us here. We all deserve suffering and punishment. But God, by his grace, has called us each by name. By God, by his grace. Notice, I even love this, and even in the midst of the wrath, he's showing long suffering. Think about, uh, you know, a fair, uh, <laughs> um, oh, the Pharaoh had a hard time with that one. As, as the Pharaoh was sitting there, we're told, you know, again in Exodus that, that, that he continued to harden his heart to God. Think about this. Even as God did miracle after miracle after miracle, Pharaoh could have repented. But he didn't, did he? He hardened his heart, and so God hardened his heart for him. He said, all right, great, you want to harden? I'm going to harden it for you. So even now, though, God is showing patience. Look at verse 23. Why? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. If you're a Christian, this is you. You see, we get through the hard stuff. Okay, we're a wisp, we're a weed, we're here today, we're gone tomorrow. But God so loves us, notice, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. Guess what the vessels of mercy are? You and I. We're the vessels of the mercy of God. You see, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are, you know, we look out on the world, those dirty, scummy sinners. We're so much better than they are. No, you are not. No, just as bad, worse. But God has saved us. He showed us his mercy. We reacted in a positive way. We repented of our sins, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and are saved. Notice here again that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. God wants to make known to you and to me the riches of his glory. You are his vessels of mercy. Have you ever thought of yourself that way? That he has shown such great mercy to us. We are now vessels, his vessels, vessels of the king to be used how he wants to use us. What a great honor and what a great blessing. You're a vessel of mercy. 
You are now vessels of God for his glory to use. This is radical stuff. So many implications that the potter has made you and I who are in Christ vessels of mercy. That, it says here in our text, to make known the riches of his glory upon you and I. Do you see the riches of the glory of God in your life? Do others see the riches of the glory of God in your life? Do they partake of the mercies of God through your life, through your words, through your actions? You see, notice, he's prepared us beforehand for this glory. The greatest honor, again, for any vessel was to be used by the king. Do you want to be used by your king today? Hey, you're his vessel. He bought you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You are now his. I am now his. We are his vessels of mercy for his glory. God's mercy has been poured out upon the Christian through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are now the vessels of the mercies of God. Oh, that we would see and hear and understand what God is telling us here today through the Apostle Paul. You and I in and of ourselves are not special. But in Jesus Christ, you are the most precious thing to God in the entire known and unknown universe. Do you understand that? God didn't come here to die so we could get all the gold in the world or all the silver in the world or all the diamonds or all the fame. He came to get you. He came to get you. He came to get your soul. Jesus died for our sins. Can we, anybody else, how many many people have had somebody die for them? Love you so much, they didn't just say it. God just doesn't say that he loves you. He came and he proved it by dying on the cross. Not only did he create you, but he then died for you. And he has called you by name now to be his son or daughter. The choice is ours. Many of us here, most of us here today have responded. We are now adopted uh, by Jesus Christ. Adopted daughters and sons of God. Adopted through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The question is, let me ask you this as we're closing. Are we allowing ourselves to display the glory of God and to be those um, vessels of mercy to a world that is lost today? Or are we just living for ourselves? I don't know about you, man, but I left that behind, way behind when I got saved. Not perfect, but man, Lord Jesus, use me for your glory. And I know I'm gonna blow it because I'm a bonehead, but use me for your glory. Use this donkey. Use this vessel. I am yours by your mercy. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, even as we're here this morning, Lord, it's all about you. Even as we're singing your praises earlier, Lord, it's all about you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that by your grace we have been purchased through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that even though we're here today, gone tomorrow, that we're nothing special. We're everything to you. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your love, Lord. We don't deserve it, but thank you. Thank you for your spirit. Please bless and anoint. Use us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.